Hi, I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. My guest is the host of the podcast, Word to Your Mama, which can be found wherever you listen to podcasts, so make sure you check out Word to Your Mama. When referring to her mother, she says, quote, I blame her for nothing and forgive her for everything, which it it just gives me the chills. It really does Uh, whenever I read that. It's such a powerful and a compassionate statement. She lost her mom almost three decades ago to breast cancer, And she's going to tell us more about her mom who left us way too young. So Should Have Listened to My Mother is proud to introduce Ritzy Periwinkle to the show. Hi, Ritzy P. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, thanks for having me. Basically, just from the little bit of exchanges that we've had before we started recording this interview, the flash of emotions abound and and I'm not even the one that lived through it. So why don't we start with you telling us your mom's name? Her name is Consuelo Rivera. She's an immigrant, correct? Yes. Immigrant from Mexico. And you live on the West Coast, I believe. Yes. Uh, and I grew up, uh, I don't live there now, but I grew up in San Diego, California. Okay. Do you have siblings? I do have a... Younger brother, we share the same mother, different fathers. Tell us a little bit about Consuelo. How old was she when she came to the States? That's a little fuzzy. I believe, from what I just learned recently, that she came to the States when she was maybe a teen and then went back and then came back when she was pregnant with me. Because I think there was a, you know, they, my family didn't um, like my biological father. And this is literally, I just found out the story a couple of months ago that no one knew that they were even dating that seriously. And then when she became pregnant, she left Mexico to come back to the States. And I think it was a mix of maybe being kicked out. And on her own, I think it was a mix of both. Uh, but we, it is unclear still. Uh, I heard this story from my aunt, who was her younger sister, a couple of months ago, which I had no idea. So that was very interesting. Did she come to the States with her boyfriend at the time or husband? I don't know if they were married. No, no, they were never married. And no, my biological father knows. She came solo. Um, and I believe if the timelines are connecting, I believe he was maybe at the time had just gone or was about to enter the military. I believe he became a naturalized citizen and then was gone. So then she came over and then she became a naturalized citizen. Um, and that's, that's what I, I think she was, I think, I believe she was maybe in her early twenties when she was pregnant with me. And she had no family here, nothing, no friends. Well, she had my she had my aunt, who was her younger sister. Um, so she she lived there, and, and that's my earliest memory of us living there with my cousin, her son, who is about I think he's six years older than me. So that kind of was maybe her only support system at the time. And I do also remember. Uh, the youngest memory I have is maybe four years old that we end up living on our own and we're on welfare. Other than the obvious thoughts that come to mind, why did she want to, why did she leave Mexico and come here once she knew she was pregnant? I, I don't know. I would assume it, it, it's, it's also crazy because she when she passed, I was 20. She was sick for a couple of years. And I didn't have the chance to have those adult conversations and ask those questions. You know, when you become an adult and your parent is an adult, you could talk about the history, perceived histories in a certain way and ask those real questions. I didn't get that chance. So I, I don't know. It's pieces from, from a couple of different people. And the, 
the people that I the the people most important people that I need to ask, uh, they've all passed. <laughs> like my grandmother, my mom, and my aunt's still around, but she doesn't know. She told me everything that she knew uh, a couple of months ago. She was like, I don't, I don't, I didn't even know they were together. <laughs> how do you process all of this and how do you proceed to live your life? What's your philosophy without the answers to these questions? I think by experience, by experiencing everything that she went through, seeing that she was, um, you know, I'm a child of an immigrant, and that she was a woman during the time of the 80s, 70s and 80s. She was a woman of color. Her prospects and her ability to move forward were very limited, especially because what I do know is they had they had to work to help the family. So the education, I believe, ended around what would be considered now maybe middle school, if at the most. And so the, the decisions that she made at the time as I was living through it, I was go, growing up, um, you know, the, being with my, the father of my brother and, and that traumatic situation, what I learned is that I could have gone two ways. I could have continued the cycle of trauma and gotten with someone as abusive or more abusive. And, and, but I decided, I, I remember specifically, as clear as yesterday, I was in second grade, and it was a abusive situation happening at the house. And I was like, no. I, this is not going to be me. This is not going to be me. And also, which is funny, but it's not funny. It's funny to me to think now I was second, I was like in second grade, so I was maybe, what, seven years old, to think that I could really do what I wanted to do. But I remember thinking, like, this is not going to happen to me, and how do I make this stop happening to my mom? And I was like, okay, how do I kill this man as a seven-year-old? little girl, and I remember vividly looking at what was around me and what I could do, and I remember we had one of those, you know, it was the 70s and 80s, you had one of those maybe glass lamps that the body of the lamp was pretty big, say two, three feet, and I was like, oh, that's what I'll do. I'll get that, and I'll crack it against the wall, and then I'll have all these shards, and then I can stab. I mean, it was that vivid, like... It was a plan that I didn't do, of course, but I remember that was the turning point for me, that I knew that that fork in the road was no longer a fork in the road. I knew the direction of my life, that I was not going to put myself in that situation. I was not going to allow any man to do that to me So since seven years old. And so her choices which now I understand. At the time, I did not. And at, at the time, I was angry. I didn't understand. It was, it was a lot of the typical story of we leave, then we come back. We leave, and then we come back. And it was a lot of my mom saying she's had enough. We leave, we go stay with my aunt. Then my mom would eventually get lured back. And then my aunt would be, just stay here. And I'd be like, no, I, I can't leave her alone. I have to go back. She, I, she needs backup. She needs something. So that's when I was like, I, this is not going to this is not gonna be my story. So at seven, you became her protector. Oh, for sure. For sure. And it, it, was, it was hard living in that house. Because as, uh, you know, not being able to, she had to stop working and she couldn't, he wouldn't allow her to drive. And it was, it was high stress. So I, I believe I do, I've been going to therapy for a long time and I, I do have PTSD and everything like that. But I didn't talk to the man. We get into it all the time in a way that it was never allowed for her to talk to him and have those assessments once I was older. 
and there was a period of maybe a year, maybe, maybe a year and a half that I, we, him and I did not speak, even though we lived in the same house. But it was hard because he was the breadwinner. We were living in his home. We had to abide by his rules. And because of that, I was out of the house. And whenever I could get the chance, uh, since I was a kid, whoever was my best friend at the time, I practically lived at their home, was spending the night, was there for dinner, could be there as long as I could. If I wasn't spending the night, like, what is the last minute of time that I could stay here before I have to go back to my house? It didn't feel like a home, never felt like a home. Was he ever abusive to you, other than emotionally and verbally watching and seeing your mom? Yeah, he was uh, abusive, verbally abusive to me. He was physically abusive when I was young, but I think, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to his, to his mind. I don't know what decision he made. Um, I also was aware, you know, and recently uh, I always thought, that, you know, I had this amazing superpower that I could read people's vibes and I can read the temperature of the room and read the room. And when there's danger, I know what's happening. I'm always aware, kind of like, a, one, you know, a, a hero, a spy in a movie, always knows the exits, always knows that something's happened when you think that they don't know what's happening. I always thought that was my one of my superpowers. But now... <laughs> Years later, as an adult and after therapy, I know it's just childhood trauma. And I feel maybe I saved myself by always being aware. I could tell when he was about to go off. I could tell that, you know, if he started, you know, he was also Mexican, but I could tell if he started saying some words in English or certain words in Spanish, I could tell the vibe was about to change and we were about to get it somehow, some way. Um, so... Yeah, so I believe that maybe looking back, that might have saved me where I was able at a young age read the room and basically I just lived in my room. <laughs> I didn't, my, the living room, the common areas was never a home. I could never relax and lay down and hang out like my other friends could at their houses because it was always prim and proper and he would not talk to me. And he would point, if I was slouching in the sofa, he'd tell my mom to tell me. that. So it was just like, oh, okay, I can't relax here. I'm going to go to my room. <laughs> From your knowledge, your mom had no other abusive relationships in her background or in her family. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard. I never saw it. I never witnessed it. Um, so maybe had stopped. My grandparents were really old already when I was young, um, but I had heard that my grandfather, who was my best friend, so when I heard this news, it, it, it killed me that he was abusive towards my grandmother. So I believe they saw it in, the, you know, all my aunts and my uncle saw it in the home as they grew up, so my mom must have witnessed it, um, and so as far as I know. But I never witnessed it firsthand, and I haven't heard anything. I don't know my biological father, but I haven't heard anything of him ever being abusive. But also, we don't know that because we didn't even know that they were dating until my mom ended up being pregnant with me. So who's to say? You're basically always waiting for the other shoe to drop, or you're tiptoeing around, waiting for the next explosion. So I can totally sympathize with you about your your whole emotional state then as well as now, and you don't want to repeat this behavior. So it's even more stressful. And I, and I know, I didn't know your mom, but I know that she would never want you to repeat getting involved in a relationship like that. Yes, for sure. For sure. I'm, I'm one of the reasons why I didn't want to become a mom for the longest was I was like, I have too much baggage myself and I'm too damaged and I, and I don't want to repeat certain things that my mom was the, the good thing. The other side was my mom was a, this amazing, sweet, loving, caring person. 
And I was like, I'm not that. <laughs> I was like, I don't have that in my body. I don't have the the um, maternal um, instincts, which I thought. But, you know, life, the universe has other plans. And when I became a mom, late, I was a late mom. My son's only eight. Um, things changed. And I was like, oh, the purpose of what I went through, what I'm able to take from it is that I don't ever want to be in an abusive relationship. I want someone to love and respect me. I, I've, broken, I've broken that cycle. And then as a mom, I want to be the best version of myself, and I don't want to cause that anxiety. I don't want that type of home environment for our son. And so hopefully, I, I believe they will agree, uh, my husband and my son, that that's not the case, that he feels loved and he feels comfortable, <laughs> maybe a little too comfortable sometimes, but comfortable <laughs> where he can, where it feels like a home. No matter where we're at, he feels loved and he feels comfortable, and it's a home. And that's all I could have ever, you know, hoped for and and strived for, and I feel like, because of what I've gone through, what my mom showed me with her actions by even being in that type of situation, remaining the most generous, sweetest person, despite what she was going through. And always, I think also because I wasn't his, you know, my my brother's father, uh, my brother's father's daughter, there was a disconnect. So there was, he I, he could say what could be done in the house, but he couldn't say really what would, what, he didn't have a say in my, in my uh, you know, childhood and what I could or could not do outside of the home. Right, he didn't have the control because he wasn't your biological father. Yes, I think that's also something that was a, uh, point of contention, but I feel my mom was able, with the little that she had, was able to provide for me what she could. And I, looking back, you know, being a child of immigrants, and, you know, if you've had anyone on here as such, you know, we, we grew up young anyways, whether we are in an, grew up in an abusive household or not, because at a young age, we are set to translate big world adult concepts to our parents because they don't understand the language and so we are going back and forth and translating these things and you know because of the situation we were in you know I was a, a in honors classes and was in all these different types of amazing situations but because of what was happening at home I wanted to to get out of that, which would have set me up to be, you know, graduate early and all these different things. But because of what was happening at home, I was a translator. She didn't know that we were having this meeting with the teachers and the counselors to get me out of this program that could have set me up, if that makes sense. Did you ever share what was going on at home with a friend or a teacher, counselor, anybody? No, and what's very interesting is that I assumed people knew without me sharing it. I don't know. I, I assumed, and uh, maybe it's been eight years ago, maybe six years ago. I found maybe one of the only male figures in my life that was positive, and it was my sixth grade teacher. And I've been searching for him forever because I wanted to thank him. And I think I called him, and I remember I was, like, falling. I remember he sent me, like, notes, like, you're amazing. Like, I hope to know you. Like, I would finish stuff in class, and he would allow me to do extra stuff and teach class certain things. And he was amazing. And I told him I got to speak with him. I had the honor of talking to him and thanking him. And, and I was like, you know, you were a bright light. In darkness, and he's like, I had no idea. He said, you came to, to class always smiling, and it's just a joy. And 
And I, I thought he knew. He had no idea. And this was like, what, 30 something years later. And I have one of my, you know, best friends, we've been talking as an extra show of an extra podcast within a podcast where we talk about when we met and we met in junior high and middle school for those now and she had no idea of these stories I actually just recently shared that seven year old second grade murder story murder plot story and she was like she was shocked she said she had no idea and we've been best friends since then Oh, my gosh, that's just so hard for everybody. Yeah, because you, you don't realize when you're kids, you're going through these things and you're just learning to be a, a human, you know, let alone dealing with whatever you're dealing with, that you realize you don't have these conversations with your friends. Like, oh, you know, the house sucks, my home life sucks. We, you know, <laughs> we didn't have that. I just thought it was written all over my face, but I guess it wasn't. You learned to hide it very well. Oh, yeah. Too well, unfortunately. Yeah. So not only was your mom a survivor of an abusive relationship, she had another huge obstacle that presented itself. When did she get diagnosed with breast cancer? She was diagnosed, which was, let's see, 90, 1990, I believe. Um, and then she had the, um, double mastectomy, went through chemo and everything, and she was in remission, and then when I went to college, that was 92, 93, then it returned in different parts of her body, she gave it a good go, and, uh, I just took her out. While your mom was sick, did she still dream or wish for a good future for you? Could she still possibly see the light or at least pretend to see a bright future? Uh, yeah. She, when, he, when her husband was not around, I felt like she could release. Her shoulders would relax, and her and I would, you know, be able to feel a little bit at home at the house and she would when I got older um before she passed she would be like oh I can't wait for you to graduate college and be with your briefcase and be a businesswoman and you and I can go travel and do the all these different things and uh I will say you know she was uh, a great dancer and I also heard that she was one of the best dancers when she was young um and I, it's one of my favorite things. It's one of my activities that I can zone in and zone out, that it's good for my soul. And I know that I got it from her. So she knew how to just be free in a way when, when she had that ability to let herself go and be open to pleasure and joy. Yes, I think she maybe, unfortunately, only had a couple of windows of that throughout her life. Um because I think she just did the best that she could. Looking back now, I can see she was, she was probably thinking like, oh, I have this, this this daughter and, you know, I can only move so far in the workspace because of my status. And I'm going to get with this man because that's what I've been told to do. And that way we can have a home, live in a pretty decent neighborhood considering and I can provide that I can at least provide that for her so many men and women get caught up in this cycle but unfortunately the consequences can be dire very often there are definitely repercussions but she thought she was doing her best for you so you learned a lot of really positive and um, empowering things from your mom. So she definitely was able to shine the light in your direction, as you said, at the second grade. And I think you should, this is a side note, but the story that you referred to recently as the, the plot to kill your, 
<laughs> you should call that your superpower moment. <laughs> yeah. Not the plot to take them out, even though the end result is the same. But just give it up maybe a more positive spin. That might be good because that's, that's a lot for a kid to, to deal with, that's for sure. Now, you say for your podcast, you're a proud supporter of culture, justice, and diversity. Are these lessons that you learned from your mom and your experience? Yes, for sure. I just, I feel like since that time, I was the underdog, my mom was the underdog. I just, I've always been an advocate for speaking up for those who don't have a voice or that are not able to. And that's always been something that's very important to me and in any way possible. And those opportunities have evolved. And whenever a new opportunity comes up, I want to make sure that I can do that. And so knowing the things that I've gone through, because of the choices my mom made, I am only here today thriving, not just surviving, because of therapy. And that's not a huge thing that is supported in marginalized communities especially. And so that is has been my latest mission is to tell these diverse stories of these amazing people that I've met since I've worked in the art world, also the music industry and beyond. And there's always with without a doubt, without even trying to get there, there's always a story of mental health, mental wellness, trauma. And I want to be able to share that with the world because there's the, you know, they say it's the, the universal and the specific. All of us sharing our stories and being some commonality and hopefully being something that maybe you're at a certain part in your life where that might be the catalyst to some real amazing change. What do you think um, Consuelo is saying to your mom, is saying to you at this very moment? Oh. I'm trying not to cry, thank you, but... It's okay. <laughs> Either the guest cries or I cry pretty much in every episode, so <laughs> not to worry. I mean, I've never... I've never thought of what um, that people tell me all the time, like, oh, my God, she'd be so proud of you. But I think leading up to knowing that I was going to be talking to you about her and our relationship and her impact specifically, I, I mean, I think she would be proud. And I don't you know that it's necessarily based on what I've accomplished, what I had accomplished in my life. There's a lot, but I think beyond that, and more importantly, I think she would be very proud because despite everything, I'm a good person. An amazing accomplishment for a woman who suffered a lot. Look at how you were able to springboard and, and change your life because of her. And you are... An amazing mom to your son. Is he the supernatural bear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would celebrate your mom every minute because she did give you a gift. She had to pay a price, but she gave you many gifts. She did. And uh, I always say I'm my, mom's, I'm my mother's vengeance. Um, and I think on all those levels, she would be very proud. I saw one of your quotes where you say, live the life I have imagined. Yes. And and she she was a huge part in, in in that in that being part of my journey. A goal set at such a young age. And it was not just because I would tell myself I don't want to be in this type of relationship, but it was also because I saw the limitations, the discrimination, um, and all that that my mom had to deal with. 
um, growing up in that time, um, being Mexican and being a woman, and I'm the same thing. And I knew that all the things that she said she wanted to do with me one day, I could still do. And even though she's not physically here with me, she was she's always with me and always a part of me. And I'm, she still could be a part of that journey. I like that. I believe that. I believe that my parents are with me every minute and other people that I've lost, I feel them, and um, it would be very hard to move forward if those if that wasn't my belief, because I I count on their support. <laughs> that might be selfish of me, but I count on it, and I it just makes me smile. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to get in touch with your sixth grade teacher and tell them I say thank you. <laughs> for being there for you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, she's amazing. Ritzy P. Ritzy Periwinkle, the host of the podcast Word to Your Mama. I really thank you for joining us. Thank you.